If you enjoy this program, please like and subscribe. All right, Joseph, welcome back. Go ahead with the question. Yeah, shalom, Rabbi. So my question this morning is on Isaiah 53, and whether it's talking about Israel or the Messiah, isn't the general theme of the chapter vicarious atonement like someone, whether it be the nation or the individual, paying the price for the sins of the nations? And isn't that, like, by definition, vicarious atonement? Good question. This is very important. The question is, think very carefully, you the viewer, of a time and experience that you had that caused you to reconsider your own life. It might be something traumatic, right? Something happens, a realization that disconfirms your former beliefs and brings you around to sometimes, God forbid, person becomes ill. Sometimes I have had people tell me that they were high on drugs and said, God, if you somehow save me from this cocaine binge, I'll repent. There are people who have told me that they've watched Fiddler on the Roof and cried their eyes out, and at the end, they did shuva. Others watched documentaries like the show on the Holocaust and Schindler's who repented. There are triggers that cause people to repent. Okay, That's the key. That cause people to do tshuva. I know so many people who, when studying about the suffering of the Jewish people, just repented and turned to the God of Israel. And it's kind of counterintuitive in a sense that if I thought there was a group of people that for some reason were so radioactive that everyone wanted, wanted to kill them, I'd want to just stare clear of them. <laughs> You'd want to stay away from the Jew. But as it turns out, we've, we're told from the get-go that the nations would be very drawn to the Jews. They would bless the children of Israel. Isaiah 60, the nations arise and shine, for your light has come. Kings will go by your light. Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. The sons of them that afflicted you would come bowing down to you. It's the same chapter. There's something very striking about Jewish suffering in that it could trigger in the heart of a Gentile the desire to do tshuva, to repent. This is a phenomenon. We don't, if we hear about other peoples that are suffering, we don't necessarily want to join their religion, right? But with their Jew is different. So that's not vicarious atonement. That means it, when the Jew suffers, like most of my family was wiped out in the spring of 1944 when Hungarian Jewry was destroyed. Uh, if a person learns about just what happened in a very short span of time, in fact, Hungarian Jewry was destroyed. Half a million Jews were murdered within a very short span of time. In fact, the genocide of Jews in Hungary uh, occurred more rapidly than in any other part of Europe during World War II, right? So, so as it turns out... Uh, if someone examines that and learns about what occurred toward the end of World War II and repents, does tshuva, and becomes a Noahide, turns back to the God of Israel, may convert to trees and may not, that's not vicarious. Vicarious means something. What does that word vicarious mean? Vicarious conveys that Something died there, and that's a ransom, and that's the language used in the Christian Bible. So I'm very deliberately borrowing the word that's used in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The ransom part it means he dies, and I benefit from it. So that is an abomination. That's a mother load of very, very bad ideas. Christianity didn't invent it. The idea that virgins could be slaughtered in Central America 
and that you, if that would satisfy the gods, that's vicarious atonement. It's an abomination. But if I observe the suffering, you know, I, I just think about Schindler's List for a moment. It's a film that probably most of you have seen. I remember I was lecturing in Binghamton University. And um, when you're driving from New York to Binghamton, so you, you travel, it's like a whole long schlep. It's like 185 miles, but you got Route 17. You're never sure how long it's going to take. So for whatever reason, I arrived in Binghamton hours before I was set to speak at the university. And the film had just come out, so I went to see it in the theater there. I had plenty of time. You know, it, I cried like a baby, and the whole theater, was, everyone was just crying, just crying. It's a very striking film. Why? Well, part of it is, not for the reason, like Oscar Schindler was a German. He was not Jewish. He was a member of the Nazi party. If for a moment, consider, if this, the protagonist, Oscar Schindler, was Jewish, the film wouldn't be as moving. What's so striking about this film, in my view, is the transformation of this man who was a womanizer, who was a profiteer from the war, and who could care less about anything but money and women and drink, right? And then he goes through a transformation because the film was in black and white, but there was the girl with the red coat. You remember her? And she's in red. The only thing in color besides the candlelights at the end. And when he sees her body taken away, he undergoes a complete transformation and gives away everything he has to save every Jew. And at the end of the war, his only misgiving was that this pen, this pen, this car, maybe I could have saved more Jews. Why is that so powerful? Why is it impossible to watch that film without completely breaking down? So I would posit, of course, the suffering of the Jews, all that, but it's what happened to this man, who happened to have been a Roman Catholic German member of the Nazi party. But what is so shocking about it is his repentance and what triggered his repentance. Why does this film seize the imagination? Why does it touch people so deeply? I've thought about this a lot. And it's because Oscar Schindler himself was redeemed. He changed from a womanizer and a, a person who profited from the war, who didn't care um, and couldn't understand why a one-armed Jew would be of benefit. And he changed. He changed because he observed the suffering of the Jew. And that's why this film penetrates everything and causes many people just to rethink. And I think that's the, the power of the film. And as I said, if the character, the main character, was a Jewish person trying to save Jews, it wouldn't be nearly as interesting, nearly as powerful. If the person playing Isaac Stern would have been saving Jews, and the, and the film wouldn't be that. It would be interesting, but nowhere near as powerful. And that's what's conveyed in Isaiah 53, that the Gentiles... The nations of the world, you ha if you don't understand that the 53rd chapter, the first eight passages, contains a soliloquy where the nations, kings of nations, are speaking aloud in their numbed astonishment when they realize that the Jews all along were correct. And they ask the question, who would have believed this? Who would? And they conclude two things. Number one, that what caused us to repent. Remember Isaiah 52, verse 15. It's very important. No context, you're dead in Isaiah. Dead, dead. So 52, 15. So shall we cast down many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, which had not been told to them. 
finally understand. That's literally the passage prior to Isaiah 53.1. That's the pericope prior to 53.1, where the second pericope that extends for eight passages. Okay. So the non-Jews are, will exclaim this in the Messianic age. Two things. Number one, by his stripes we were healed. I mean, the suffering of the Jews caused us to repent. Number two is, me pesha ami negalamo, for the transgressions of my people, they suffered. I tell you, I'll share this with you. This is probably unique for you, but I've, I've met no small number of grandchildren of Nazis. And in, invariably, they would apologize to me for what their grandparents or fathers did. And I was, I, I couldn't say thank you because it didn't make sense to me. You didn't do anything, and I would tell them that. They would find that very unsatisfying. Invariably, they wanted to be forgiven, and they invariably felt that they were somehow culpable. So I would say, you didn't do anything, you know, you're not responsible for what your father did or what your grandfather did. So um, so that's what's going on in 53. So we have to be very careful about the word vicarious. Vicarious means it's a ransom. The teenage girl is killed in an Aztec ceremony where her chest is cut open, her heart is removed by a priest. And that satisfies the gods. And if you travel in Mexico and Central America, they have areas just loaded with the ancient Mayan and Aztec altars where children were offered to the gods, to appease God. That's vicarious atonement. That's not going on here at all. It is very Jewish in Tanakh where people can see others suffering and repent. In fact, in Isaiah 57, just four chapters later, Isaiah admonishes the children of Israel his audience, and he says, I took away the righteous of your generation. Like you didn't even care, which is not a good thing. So that's not vicarious atonement. That's not what's in view in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. As it turns out, as an aside, Luke held this view, this Jewish view. Luke did not, uh, this is very important strategically in the gospel problem, where you have Matthew and Luke invariably take, using almost all of Mark. But there are intriguing occasions where Luke will not pick up what Matthew picks up from Mark. So this, for those of you who are more knowledgeable about this, you have passage in Mark, and then they'll, not always, but almost, if it's picked up by Matthew, it's picked up by Luke and vice versa. And they're both using nearly all of the 679 passages of Mark. But Luke won't touch this. So there is, so whereas you have it in the ransom passage in Mark, and you have it in Matthew, because they both held that, Luke will not touch it. And in and in contradistinction, Luke will view atonement coming through repentance, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It's not in Luke's view that Jesus' death had no value. It was very important in Luke's view, but it was different. In Luke's view, if you thought about Jesus' death, it would then cause you to repent, which is m more similar to Judaism. But that is not Pauline. That is not an idea that was that Mark or Matthew favored, but that was very much Luke's view or the Luke Acts view. So that's what's going on. Two things the nations are saying: the Jews triggered our repentance by Shrites we healed, and number two is that the Jews suffered as a result of our iniquity because of our behavior. The Jews suffered. That's what's in view. You have to read the context or you're, you're done. By the way, Isaiah 52 and 54 are both about Israel in the singular, suffering at the hands of the nations, and God saves them by his outstretched arm.
Okay, so always read the context. And if you don't think context is important in the book of Isaiah, I'll challenge you to do this. Just open up arbitrarily a book of Isaiah. Just pick a number. Like, try it now, if you wish. Like, just go, just think of a number from 1 to 66, okay? That's not one of the ones, you know, just pick it. And I'm not going to tell you which one. Try it. Like, test out what I'm saying. Just pick a number from 1 to 66, and then go online and start reading it, and ask yourself, you understand what's going on. And it's very, very likely you go, I, have n I am completely lost very quickly, because it's almost all poetry, which doesn't mean Shakespearean poetry, but it's a, a, a masterful use of the Hebrew language, which is extremely dense. And if you don't know the context, you'll have no chance in understanding it. And test this out, you'll see what will happen if you try reading almost any chapter. There are some exceptions. But you try reading any chapter in Isaiah, pick, pick a number, go read it, and go, I don't know what's going on. Conversely, if you take the book of Judges or Joshua and open it any number, you probably will understand what's going on. You'll have, you'll pretty much pick it up pretty quickly. Okay? Doesn't mean you won't have questions, but you'll understand what's happening. Thank you for your thoughtful question. If you enjoy this program, please like and subscribe. Adon Olah, Asher Malach, B'terem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, B'chev Tzokor, Azai Melech, Azai Melech, Shemu Nikra. ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובד